I invite you to remain standing for the reading of God's holy word. Uh, uh, in your bulletin, you will see 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 18. For the purpose of today's message, I'm going to be reading verses 8 through 12. So that's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because of this, you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For those who would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It was just after Ben Franklin's kite flying days, some Frenchmen were experimenting with electricity, and they wanted to see how fast it moves. The abbot of a large monastery, he volunteered his monks for the experiment. The monks had taken a vow of obedience, so they didn't really have much say in the matter. Uh, he lined up a thousand monks, each holding the hand of the person next to him. And then electricity was to be applied to the first man in line. So after all thousand of them got lined up and they all began clasping hands, then the electricity was applied to the first monk. And much to their surprise, all thousand monks jumped in the air at the same time. That must have been quite a sight, a thousand monks jumping at one time. Now from this I draw three conclusions. First, Electricity moves at an astonishingly fast rate. Second, abbots in French monasteries in the 18th century had tremendous amount of authority over their monks. And third, wouldn't it be wonderful if a thousand people in the church today got excited enough to jump into the air at the same time? It's hard to get that much cooperation in most churches. And in this epistle, Peter tells us, uh, he explains to us, he shows us, he, he paints a picture, if you will, that we are to be one big happy family. Well, you and I know that even the happiest of families have their problems. I, I like the story of a family who changed churches. They moved from the Methodist church to a Presbyterian, and the, the youngest son, a little boy, he was a little slow at catching on to the Lord's Prayer. And one day, he and his big brother got into an argument, and his older brother says, you don't even know how to say the Lord's Prayer. You don't say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You are supposed to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are dead against us. <laughs> now, I hope that none of you in this church family have anyone who is dead against you. And yet, within the happiest of families, there are bound to be conflicts. We see that throughout the beginning of even the earliest times of the churches. Paul advises us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, to be compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Paul continues to do this. He points to the fact that we are to forgive one another, and then he reminds us that it was Christ in God who forgave us first. This seems to be a common theme for Paul, and when he's writing to his earlier churches. Now, in the church, uh, in the Colossian church, in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, 
holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Now, wouldn't that be something if each of us clothed ourselves in these attributes? And Paul tells us to do this, and then this is how we are supposed to treat one another through these lenses, through these characteristics. And then he goes on to say, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive, here it is again, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, many of the saints of old, they, they saw the church as being one big happy family. Now that is the ideal model for the church anyway. But how do we recapture this harmonious relationship in the church today? Where do we find the electricity that will cause 100 people or 200 people or 1,000 people all to jump at the same time? We find it by reminding ourselves of who we are and what we are about We do it by asking ourselves, if you will, three important questions. Every time we gather together to do the business of the church, every time we gather together in the house of the Lord, every time we gather together as the body of Christ, we should be asking ourselves, first of all, what can we do to point people to Jesus? And then a close follow-up question to this, uh, it would be a a 1A and a 1B, if you will, is how can we help people love God more? We're not in the business of building beautiful buildings. We're not in the business of producing ear-pleasing music or preaching good sermons or providing a a setting which is favorable for fellowship. We are in the business, first of all, of helping people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then to help people to know and love God more. One thing that I have found over the years is that many people are afraid to take that plunge. They're afraid to take that next step. They're afraid to fully surrender themselves and their lives to the word of God and to the will of God. They're afraid that God will somehow place some intolerable burden on them. Bill Bright, who is founder of the Campus Crusade, once dealt with this in a beautiful way. He said, my wife and I have two grown sons. And suppose that when they were little boys, if they had come to me when I had come home from a trip and they had said, we love you, Dad. We missed you, Dad. We're so excited about having you home. We've been talking about some things together while you were away, and we have decided that we are going to do anything you ask us to do. From now on, You issue the command, and without any questions, we will not question you. (laughs) Pipe dream, right? (laughs) Any of you who've ever raised children know that. Well, what do you think, Dr. Bright asked? Would you have thought my response would be because of their expression of love for me? How do you think I would have responded based on their expression of love for me if I had responded the way many people expect God, the Father, to respond? He says, it would have been something like me. uh, And then he stops and he says, let me ask you. Do you think I would have taken them by the shoulders and I'd have got down on their level and I would have looked them in the eye and I would have said, I have been waiting for you to make this decision all of your life. And now, now I'm going to make you regret it. Now I'm going to take all the fun from your lives. Now I'm going to make you regret the decision to trust me with your life for the rest of your lives. No, I wouldn't have done that, he says. I would have put my arm around them, and I would have given them great big hugs. And I would have said, I love you too, and I want to be a better father to you. I want to justify your faith in me. I want to do everything I can to help you live full and meaningful lives. And then he turns and he asks the question. 
He says, do you really think that God would respond any other way to your pledge to love and obey him? You see, I've been thinking about this, and I believe that one of my, if not my primary purpose as your pastor is to remind you often that God loves you and to seek to help you in every way respond in love and in obedience to his will for your life. And our primary purpose as a church family is to point others to Jesus and to help people to come to love him more. Ted Rendell describes a marine creature called a limpet. Uh, an limpet, it, it's commonly along the Atlantic shoreline, and it, it lives in a rather flat shell, and it clings tenaciously to the rocks right there in the seashore. And it's so sensitive to the approach of danger that when a person comes near, it adheres itself to the rock that it's on, and it is almost impossible to pry it loose. What a grand thing it would be if each of us would cling in such a way to God, the way that a limpet clings to a rock. What if each of us clung to our faith in such a way? What if each of us clung to the faith that we have in Jesus Christ in such a way? What if each of us clung to God like that so tightly that you could not pry us loose? You know, Philip Brooks preached a sermon on the phrase in the New Testament, which is, says, make the men sit down. That's the King James Version. It comes from when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, and, and he tells the apostles, he tells them, make the men sit down. You see, the people had been pushing and stirring and following and surging all day long, and in order for Jesus to be able to minister to them, in order for Jesus to be able to feed them, in order for Jesus to be able to give them what they needed, it was necessary for them to sit down in his presence so that he could give them what it was that they needed. So that they might receive from him what he was prepared to give to them. That is, in large part, what a worship service is all about. We have been pushing and surging all week long in the marketplace or in the schools or, or anywhere amongst friends and foes alike, pushing and prodding and pulling all week long. And now it is time for us to sit down and waity, wait in the readiness for what he has to give us. Our first task as the church is to point people to Jesus and to help people come to love God more. And the second one is this, to help us to love one another more. I like the way the Living Bible translates uh, Peter's words here in verses 8 and 9. It says, you should be like one big happy family full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't set, snap back at those who say unkind things to you. Instead, pray for God's help for them. For we are to be kind to others, and God will bless us for it. I like that. I, don't, don't snap back at those who say unkind things to you. <laughs> Well, you know, that happens in family sometimes too, doesn't it? Sometimes we say unkind and unwise things. You know, just over the, uh, <laughs> over the course of this past weekend, we went and uh, Jennifer and I went and visited uh, Juliana and Josh and Baker and spent some time with them and, and just, you know, dealing with, and we had Baker with us one night in the hotel room and he was crying and fussing and just, man, oh man, giving us some what for. He was just, you know, unfamiliar settings and, you know, nothing can kind of get unnerve you a little bit like an infant that's crying and won't stop crying, right? It tends to raise the blood pressure a little bit, doesn't it? And, and so while Jennifer and I are both trying to fix this and resolve this and I'm worried about the neighbor is next to us and the neighbor is upstairs and, and, and I'm going, we, we're in a hotel room, we're not in a house, we got to get, we got to get them to quiet down a little bit. We got a little bit tense. 
And any of you who have ever met my wife and know Jennifer, you know she is a type A, type char- take charge kind of person. And she's just going to say exactly what she thinks, usually when, she, when she's thinking it. And never in spite or boldness, never in meanness, but yeah, sometimes in boldness, but never in meanness. Just She's got that Italian and that Irish in her, y'all. And I've been married. How I've survived almost 30 years is I have learned when it's time to bite my tongue. And she said something which I perceived as rude or I perceived as unkind. And I wanted to respond in turn. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. I hadn't had any sleep. This this baby's fussing. You said something which I disagree with, and I want to correct you immediately. Point the error of your ways and notch this day in our calendar and forever return to it and rejoice in this moment when I was right and you were wrong. (laughs) That's what I wanted to do. But then the Holy Spirit said, Sean, steal your tongue. Remember what you are preaching on this Sunday. Do not say unkind things. Do not snap back. And so it said something like, I said, responded and said with something like, yes, dear, I love you, sweetheart. What can I do to help? (laughs) Uh, Sometimes that's what is required for us to to love one another. It's not so much, you know, you've heard it always say you can be right or you can be married, right? I've chose to be married. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not what we say, it's how we say it. You, know, you, you understand exactly what I'm saying. And sometimes you want to respond in turn. And oftentimes we have to stop and ask ourselves in the moment, why is this spouse or this brother or this sister or my, 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 my friend or my Sunday school class member or my fellow church member, why, why, why do they say that? Why, why, do they, why do they look at me that way? Often we misread feelings and misread facial expressions and things of that nature too, right? So sometimes it's just a matter of pausing and saying, okay, but what is it I wonder which is happening right now, maybe in their life that, you know, why they look that way today or why they spoke to me that way today and Realize more times than not, what I've come to understand is when someone is cross with me, usually, not always, but usually it's more to do with them, what's happening with them, than what it is has to do with me. So here's the real strength in the church. The real strength in the church is the love that we share for one another. If we could but help people know that such love exists... You know, among people's greatest fears, if you were to do a survey amongst people's greatest fears, oftentimes the number one greatest fear that people experience is the fear of not being loved. And the next one, it has something to do with value, of not feeling valued. My friends, there are a lot of people in this world with this great fear. And if they only knew that in the church, It is not only about loving God, first and foremost, yes, about loving God, but it's not only about loving God, but it is also about loving one another. In his book, Rebuild Your Life, Dale Galloway talks about when he was custodian in a large church when he was in college. He was putting himself through college, and one evening he was cleaning the sanctuary, and he opened one of the windows, and he watched a little bird fly and, and, and perch right there in the window ledge, and before long it flew inside, and it was just having a time. It was flying all around the sanctuary, checking out the stained glass windows, checking out the views. From his, from his scene where he, where he was standing, it appeared that this bird was just having a wonderful time. And then somewhere along the way, the bird realized, oh, I'm trapped. How do I get out? And it flew to this window, and it flew to that window, and it flew to this window, and it flew to that window. And he said, I wanted to help it, but, it but, but I couldn't. And then finally, it flew upstairs into the balcony, and it landed. And so I went upstairs, and it was sitting on the floor, and, and I got close to it, and I tried to pick it up. And then off it went, and it flew away again. And he said, it flew all over the sanctuary, and I was so helpless to, to help it until finally it had exhausted itself, and it laid helplessly on the ground. And then it finally let me approach it, and then I gently scooped it up. And I carried it to the open window, and I extended my hands outside the window. And it sat for a moment, it extended its wings, and then it flapped. And then off it went. He says, as the bird 
flew away. It flapped its wings and he was free. Free to fly and climb the heights again. And then Galloway goes on to write this. Just a few years ago, I was broken. I was torn apart emotionally. I was trying every way I could to find a solution. And then one day, completely exhausted and not knowing what to do or how to get out of my situation, not knowing where to turn, I fell. I fell to my knees, and then I fell into the hands of a loving father. And he picked me up, and he nursed my wounds with his love, and he held me close to his heart. And he healed me from all of my brokenness, and he made me whole. God had set me free to fly to the heights again. You know, I've seen God do that sort of thing for people. Quite often, he uses the church to lift the broken and the bruised bird to life and freedom once again, does he not? Look around this sanctuary this morning. And see someone who needs an expression of love. Someone who is painfully shy. Someone who desperately needs a word of encouragement. Someone who has experienced deep disappointment or hurt. Someone who has been ravaged by sickness. Someone who has lost a loved one. Someone who is scarred. So deeply, it seems as if the wounds just cannot or will not heal. Because there is only one church that has enough electricity to cause a hundred people or a thousand people to jump at once. And that is the church where people truly love and care for one another. Did you know that in the islands of the Pacific, there is a group of natives on a tiny little island, and they consider it a sin to eat alone? That is their custom. It's called kai pao, and it was called the sin of eating alone. And some of them will go for two or three days until they find someone with whom they can share their blessings. That seems kind of odd to us. Think about that for a moment. Certainly there is no sin in eating alone. However, if you really stop and think about it, it is no accident that at the center of the Christian faith, there is a table where bread is broken and we drink from the cup together. Our first task is to point people to Jesus and to help them come into a more knowing and loving relationship with God the Father. Our, our second task is to love one another. And our third task, of course, is just as vital as the first two. We must love the world for which Christ died. You may have heard about the five-year-old who attended a regular worship service for the first time and the preacher was one of those kind, you know, the kind that get really reared up, really fired up, you know, the, the banging on the pulpit and, and really letting loose kind. And the boy was sitting in church with his grandmother and the preacher, uh, he got going. And then once he got really going, his pulpit was one of these kind of box-shaped pulpits that he preached in. And he was pacing back and forth, back and forth. And the veins were popping out of his side of his head. And he pounded on the pulpit. And he was really letting loose. And about this time, the little boy, she was, she was afraid. And she says, he says, Grandma, what are we going to do if he gets out of there? <laughs> and trying to comfort the little fella, Grandma replied, don't worry, sweetheart, he never has. Well, I want to say this. A religion that never gets out of the pulpit or the pew and goes out the door to the outside world has never properly understood the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is the gospel. 
It is for the world that Christ came, and it is for the world that the church exists. There are lots, lots of good organizations in this world. Lots of good organizations out there. There's rotary clubs and missionary societies and dozens, even hundreds of good organizations, but no organization in the world ever founded has been based upon sounder principles or rendered more vital service than the church of Jesus Christ. Here is how we recapture the electricity. Here is how we become that big, happy family the happy family that God means for us to be. To make sure everything we do in the church contributes to our three essential tasks of pointing people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and helping them come to know and love God more, to help us to love one another and to render loving service to the outside world by loving the world for which Christ died. That is who we are and what we are to be about. Praise be to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.